Hi, I'm Bill Crystal. Welcome back to Conversations. I'm very pleased to be joined again uh, by the distinguished uh, history professor at Princeton University, Sean Wilentz. Uh, we had a good discussion in July on uh, sort of using this our peg, I guess, the debates about the monuments, the renaming of the military bases that had been named after Confederates and so forth, uh, on the use and abuse of history, I guess, in our in our time. And uh, and I thought we should follow up because that was such a good discussion and discuss uh, something you've particularly focused on in some of your work. Um, you recently edited a Library of America edition of Richard Hofstadter, uh, the work of Richard Hofstadter, the great historian who died a long time ago, died young in I think 1970. Um, and you also wrote an introduction before that to his uh, volume, The Paranoid Style in American Politics. And that seems awfully relevant today in an age where conspiracy theorizing and uh, extremism of various kinds has come back. So. I thought we could use that as a basis for a broader discussion, obviously, of what to make of the current moment in light of American history. So, Sean, thanks for, for joining me again. Uh, my, my pleasure, Bill. Uh, always wonderful to be here. And it's it just for the record, in case something huge happens in the week or two or three before we release this conversation, this is what, <laughs> December 21st. So you have to say that these days in the era of Trump, because God knows where we'll be by, you know, whenever whenever this becomes public, which will be pretty soon. But so let, let me begin with this. I, I'm, I was struck, I think, in the introduction to, to Hofstadter's paranoid style, you make the point yep. that uh, he was influenced by all kinds of social science figures, but his, in a way, what he wanted to really argue was that McCarthyism and Goldwaterism, which he was so interested in, were American phenomena, and that studying American history helped you understand them. And I'm struck, I've been struck myself coming in away from the political philosophy, more political science side. Uh, there's been a ton of explanations of Trump and a kind of comparative politics perspective, what a authoritarianism elsewhere around the world, which mm -hmm, makes mm -hmm. a lot of sense, obviously. And a, mm -hmm. and a certain kind of social science perspective, political philosophy, Hannah Arendt, totalitarianism, the 30s, mm -hmm. all of which I find personally quite interesting, but maybe not quite as much as there should be in terms of uh, Trump as an American phenomenon mm -hmm. and Trumpism. So say right. a word about that and then we can, we can discuss sure. that. Well, it wasn't um, then and now or not that different in some ways. Um, <clears throat> when, when Hofstadter wrote, started writing about the paranoid style in the 1950s, he was very influenced by, by McCarthy in the McCarthy period, and um, <clears throat> which is not completely unlike what we're going through today. I mean, it's different, but it's not completely unlike it. And in looking to social science, science in having come out of Marxism, he was no, no longer going to be in that place, but he was going to try to find some other social scientific correlate or place to look to for theory, for something to structure historical experience. And, you know, the people and he and his friends, Dan Bell and others, were reading all kinds of people to try to understand um, the world and particularly the world uh, coming out of Joseph McCarthy. You know, I mean, Joseph McCarthy seemed to them to be a, an eminent, uh, an eminence or um, of, of you know, it was a popular kind of politics that they didn't like. This was not what Marx had in mind, right? Joseph McCarthy was, was seemed to be the voice of, of some kind of populist sentiment, and they didn't know quite how to figure it out. So they looked to European writers for the most part. Carl Mannheim, um, Ideology and Utopia, um, Theodore Adorno, the Frankfurt School on the Authoritarian Personality. And they, they looked to them for some kind of you know, uh, structure, some kind of way to understand beyond the historical facts. But Hofstadter was also, I mean, and out of that, there came naturally a certain kind of European frame of reference so that people were trying to understand McCarthy in the context of fascism and the rise of fascism, which, you know, I, I can understand, but nevertheless, um, Hofstadter was very clear that, you know, McCarthy came out of American history rather than out of European history. Um, that you cannot understand McCarthy with all of the possible cognates or similarities by understanding, you know, Hitler or Stalin or Mussolini or any of them, that you had to look to American history to understand where that was coming from. And that's what led him um, into his, he was, he was given a commission by the Fund for the Republic to um, look into American right-wing movements specifically. Um, and, and it's there that, that he began to look back at American history. So he was trying to find the American roots of an American problem. And so talk, let's talk about those roots. I mean, how different is Trump from Goldwater and McCarthy and how different are they both from what went before? Is, is it yeah. too, too complacent to say, well, this always just happens every generation in America and 
no big yeah. deal or the opposite. This is unprecedented. We've never seen this before. What's the, what's the truth? <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, I, unfortunately, there's a little bit of both, I think, uh, to the extent that if you read, when you read Hofstadter, I hope you'll, you'll have a chance to do so, those of you watching, um, but, but reflecting on what, what, what Hofstadter called the paranoid style in American politics, um, there are some obvious similarities um, with what's going on now, with what's, been hap what's happened all the way back to the end of the 18th century. Um, there is conspiratorial thinking. There is an idea that there is some great force out there that is dictating events um, that has to be identified and isolated and destroyed. Um, there's an idea that you, know, you yourselves, the loyal, are the, 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 the remnant of civilization that is battling you know, in, this, in this kind of Gog and Magog, Armageddon kind of uh, situation, um, that it's the, almost the end of times, that you're literally at the ramparts, and that unless you succeed in this, all, uh, you know, we'll all be damned. Uh, there are some people who kind of welcome the end of times, but this is not generally what people. So, so all of these themes, you can, you can find them recurring today. Um, um, I, I think of the QAnon phenomenon as maybe the most extreme of what we're talking about, but then again, it seems to have quite a purchase inside the, the Trump Republican Party, or as I sometimes call it, the TOP, which is Trump's own party. But I mean, that new fig configuration, they have a purchase on it. Uh, many of the same themes are there, you know, the, the conspiracy, obviously, um, the pedophilia, I mean, uh, the idea of drinking baby's blood, I mean, that goes back to old anti-Semitic, you know, um, um, tropes that go back well into European history, but again, picked up here and, and transformed here. Um, you know, so there's a lot in the way that the thing is structured that seems quite similar. And you can say, yes, okay, we're seeing a rerun of, you know, the attack on the Bavarian Illuminati. I mean, I suppose the Bavarian, the New York Times is the new Bavarian Illuminati or something. Um, but there's also, there are also grave differences. I mean, how big was that stuff, I guess, just before we get to the differences? Yeah. I mean, so it seems to me a lot of us have, I would fall, I'm sure, guilty of this, a slightly sanitized version of American history, which I guess I'm still yeah. rebelling against. Yes. You know, yes. there was some great founders and then there were just intelligent debates between, you know, Webster and whatever. <laughs> and then there was Henry Clay and Lincoln and then <laughs> yeah, there's, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah, Teddy yeah, Roosevelt yeah. and Wilson and FDR. Yeah. But there's right. a whole underside, right? That was uh, under- in every Yes, in American life and American culture. I mean, there's a huge underside, sensational, bizarre, um, ugly, nasty. Um, you know, go back to 1800. I mean, the, the, the election of 1800, which was a hotly contested election between John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. Uh, this was not a uh, political science seminar between the two of them. And um, the Federalists in particular, playing off of the French Revolution and you know the reign of terror and so forth, you know, accused uh, Jefferson and the Jeffersonians of being Jacobins, of, of intending to set up, you know, guillotines at every t little town crossroads and, you know, take care of all the local notables. And this was all going to happen. Um, it, it also connected with the anti-Jacobin European ideas, but got translated into American with the, you know, suspicions of the Bavarian Illuminati, which was a a genuine group, but nevertheless, that they somehow, they were kind of the um, George Soros of the day, right? They, they right. somehow the center of everything. So, so this goes all the way back in American history. And you ask Bill whether it's large or not. I mean, it, it comes and goes. But there have been times, moments when it's had a, a, a great deal of influence. I mean, I think of the nativists of the 1850s, for example, who were, you know, had a great political influence. Fortunately, it proved to be passing, but nevertheless, it was there. People had to take account of it. Um, and, and you can see that strain all through American history. McCarthy himself, I mean, for, for a couple of seasons there, he really did throw American politics into a, into a real tailspin, it seemed. So, so it's not marginal. It is at the center of American politics. We've been very fortunate, but um, you know, I've always, you know, there's, there's the old line about the United States, you know, that, that, that the good Lord looks over three groups of people, children, drunks, and the United States of America. Right. Um, you know, we've been very, very lucky. Um, um, but, you know, there are those who think that our luck has run out. And that's the hard part. You know, that's the second part that, yes, we've seen it all along, but we've been lucky in the past and perhaps our, our luck has run out. And then there are many other things that we can talk about, reasons that make this moment in politics, both structural and political, this moment different from anything we've seen before. I mean, it's the why Trump is different from everybody else phenomenon. So I want to get to that in just a second, because that obviously is so important, but say a word more just about McCarthy and Goldwater, since that, I mean, 
you know, that is a more immediate antecedent in the sense that they were both phenomenons right. of the same political party that Trump is right. uh, won the nomination right. of. And, and there were some actual lines of dissent, though it's a long time ago and some mm -hmm. different kind of conservative, someone would say. It's, but well, I mean, the Republican Party, like the Democratic Party, has its factions and its fights and it's, you know, some groups are in the ascendant. And in the 1950s, you know, what had been the hard nosed um, anti New Deal reactionary kind of, you know, liberty lobby Republicans were, um, you know, marginalized. I mean, that that the uh, the Eastern internationalist Rockefeller slash, well, Dwight Eisenhower Republicans were in the ascendant. Um, and Robert Taft, the uh, Mr. Republican himself, even though he was still, you know, there in the Senate, you know, he was not, he did not get the nomination in 1952, Dwight Eisenhower did. And Dwight Eisenhower, um, you know, um, made his peace with the New Deal. Um, and in many ways, you read Dwight Eisenhower today, and he sounds like a, you know, a left-wing Democrat in some ways. But um, at any rate, so there was this, I'm going to be somewhat crude about this, but there was this group inside the Republican Party that had been in the ascendant, the old guard of the Republican Party was now on the, they had to find something new. Um, McCarthy stepped into that and McCarthy was a demagogue of his own creation. I mean, you know, we, we, some ways was sweet generous, but the, um, the displaced old guard of the Republican Party, you know, did not mind having him around at all. And indeed, even Robert Taft put up with him for a very long time and it took a while even for Eisenhower to stand up to McCarthy. Um, so that was a hint that the old guard was, you know, the reactionary element in the Republican Party was going to, was still there, and was going to make a comeback. And in 64, a different version of that is what nominated Goldwater. Um, the Republican Party, which had been a Midwestern party for the most part, right? Ohio was the great Republican state, the Taft family after all. Well, it, as the country moved west, so did the Republican Party. And you did have a new um, formation within the party of Sunbelt, what was going to become the, the Goldwater slash Reagan wing of the party, which was, um, you know, hadn't been there all along by any means. And they came to the ascendancy under Goldwater. And, uh, you know, around them were, you know, I suppose the spectrum would have run from someone like John McCain in Arizona to, you know, earlier on to the John Birch Society in, 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 in the West Coast too. And, and that was the, the spectrum of, of, of West Coast Republicanism that was coming to the fore. And that's what, it was a, really a combination, I think, of the old line, old guard people and these, you know, more libertarian West Coast Republicans that, that, that accounted for Goldwater. And that really did scare, really did frighten um, 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 Hofstadter because Goldwater was willing to what sort of wink and nod with a, a lot of this stuff. Um, whereas some of the people who supported him like Bill, William Buckley were horrified at the, at the John Birch Society and so forth and really didn't want to see them have any part of it. And were, were very concerned about the anti-Semitism that was kind of lying in there too. Goldwater was, shall we say, was, was more a wink and a nod at all of that stuff. And when you found people like, you know, like, like well, people that would later become well-known like Phyllis Schlafly, Phyllis Schlafly's pamphlet from 1964, A Choice Not an Echo, is pretty scary when you look at it. I mean, it's a kind of, you know, handbook of conspiratorial thinking. Um, so Hofstadter took one look at that and saw that it was not the same as McCarthy, but in some ways it was much more dangerous because it was really contesting for na national power. I mean, this was not a senator, a wacko senator from from um, Wisconsin who was causing a lot of grief and getting a lot of, you know, doing terrible, terrible things. The, chance, the, possible, what, the possibility was that an entire political party had come under the aegis of this, you know, what he saw as a very dangerous right-wing um, element. And um, so he saw it as even more frightening than McCarthy. Hofstadter was not a particularly political man in the sense of being active in politics. You know, there are activist professors and there are professors who couldn't care less for public life. Um, Hofstadter was kind of a combination of the two, deeply, intensely interested in politics, but not a personality that was, you know, much engaged in politics um, um, until until '64. Uh, he, he did get involved in the Stevenson campaign in '52, and got burned for that a little bit. But in '64, he really he really feels as if you know he has to be mobilized. So he wrote a great deal about Goldwater, which is in that Library of American collection you so nicely mentioned. 
Um, and there and, is a, there's another book in 64, another pamphlet that I think sold like 2 million copies in those days. That was the way you got these fringy ideas out, right? Self-published or published by small, yeah, yeah. non-reputable, but nonetheless, houses with very good advertising and direct mail abilities. And it exactly. called, I, think, I think it was called non dear Call It Treason, right? And so no, they- Well, non, yeah, that was- The non dear Call It Conspiracy, there were this, I can't remember anymore, but there was- uh, Anyway, there, was, there, was a, there was more conspiratorialism going around. Goldwater right. later became a respect, very respectable figure, of course, and yes, yes. actually didn't like the new right much and so forth. But one forgets maybe how much the conspiratorial stuff was lurking there on the fringes of it, you know, and the- uh, 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 Absolutely. McCarthy, I mean, of course, too, yeah. Non dare call it treason was, I believe, the John Birch Society um, 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 pr uh, production. Uh -huh. uh, and um, well, look, I mean, when you have the head of the, the John Birch Society, Robert Welch, the candy manufacturer from Belmont, Massachusetts, you know, saying that that um, President Dwight David Eisenhower was a conscious agent of the communist conspiracy, then you're in, you know, very strange territory. And um, that was what was going on in the 1950s. But you make an excellent point, Bill, is that these were pamphlets. Now, you know, they, they had an extraordinary ability to get get out there. Their organizational abilities were amazing. Um, direct mail was going to come in later, but it was an extension of this ability to get these wacko ideas or this wacko way of thinking out there into the, into the, the mainstream. Um, but you don't just have to write pamphlets anymore. I mean, I suppose that's one of the big differences. Yeah. I, have, I do think just on the conspiracy side, again, I, I kind of feel like so much of the discussion about Trump and Trumpism has been about authoritarianism, which is obviously right. important and fine. And we'll talk right. about that too. But but the conspiracy side of it, which has come to the fore a little bit, I'd say later in the Trump, it was always there, yeah. of course, but yeah. the yeah. Uh, QAnon and so forth, maybe yeah. it's been been underrated, I would say. And 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 so I, that's, I would just say something about why conspiracism and then what's the relationship of that to the illiberalism, the sort of uh, right. uh, assaults on democratic norms and so forth. Right. I mean... I mean, conspiracy theories don't always emanate from the, the, the margins to the center. I mean, um, and I remember the 90s, I mean, you know, um, the idea that the Clintons had been responsible for the, the death of Vince Foster, this was a crazy conspiracy theory that just didn't hold water. Um, but that was at the center of politics. It wasn't at the, at, at the main, at, at the margins. So there is a kind of in and out of doing that. I think, you know, um, um, if, if you, th Here's the key, I think, in conspiratorial thinking, um, is, is if you think that you're up against a force that is illegitimate, right, that you know, ha has no legitimacy whatsoever, you're going to find yourself very easily falling into ideas that there's some sort of master force behind everything, and you're going to try to identify what that master force is. If you think that the opposition is legitimate, then you're going to, you know, you're going to have normal politics, and you're not going to be so driven to that kind of thing. But I think there's a way in which um, the, the, the drive towards, I mean, you see a certain amount of this in, before the Civil War, right? I mean, there really was a conspiracy in some, in some ways, but the way that the thinking ran was, you know, either the Yankees were completely illegitimate and there was a conspiratorial force behind them or the slaveholders were the same way. And there was no middle ground and conspiracy thinking, spiritual ideas, conspiratorial ideas kind of um, uh, worked their way up through that. Um, um, but I think it very much has to do with, you know, your position vis-a-vis -vis your opponents, your adversaries. I mean, if it's a world historic confrontation, as I say, Gog and Magog, well, you're going to be thinking in a very different way than if you think of, of what we used to think of as Democrats and Republicans or, or even Federalists and, and, and Jeffersonians. I mean, you know, there was a way in which you could have an idea of contest that was not, you know, uh, total. Right. And I guess if you think you're in the the out group where you don't have the commanding heights of power, you're, but that somehow they're not, they shouldn't have the commanding heights of power and they didn't win them fair and square. Then you're very interested right. in vast conspiracies to explain what's, what's happening here. Exactly. Right? And, and, and it's all, yes. And they have all the power. You have no power. You are powerless. So, uh, but it must be someone else who has all power. Now, you know, very often that leads to crazy, like the anti-Semitic, you know, tropes, which is that people who you deem as being subhuman somehow have all the power at the same time. Um, you know, you, you can find those strange combinations, but yes, it's not true powerlessness. It's, 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 it's a, it's an affection of, of uh, affectation of, of powerlessness. You know what I'm saying? I mean, yeah. you get powerful people saying we have no power. 
Um, but it becomes a, a position, a, a psychological, if you will, but also a political position, um, which can lead you to highly destructive politics. So let's talk about Trump and his version and the Trumpist version of conspiratorialism and right. not just conspiratorialism, but the whole package, so to speak. What, right. what makes it more, you were starting to say until I, we, we got into that little discussion that uh, it's not entirely just more of the same and that there's some distinctive right. features, both of our time, I suppose, and also maybe of Trump and his success that make it different. Right, right, right. Well, there are many different levels in which to, to, to think about this. I mean, one is Trump himself. I just look at Trump himself. Um, Trump himself was a, uh, you know, a real estate um, um, failure, mogul, uh, shyster, however you want to put it. Um, but it was a big figure. He had a, he had a, a knack for getting his name in the paper. And he was kind of, you know, the, the Roy Cohn of real estate um, by the time that he ran into Roy Cohn, who was a self-publicist of the highest order. Um, and, and then he becomes, a, 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 you know, a, a TV star, a reality show TV star. And that's the figure that's coming out with this, you know, image of glitz and, and, and money and power and so forth. And that's unlike any of the people we've seen before. We've never seen the likes of that before. I mean, most populist demagogues are either sweaty, you know, slightly, um, you know, uh, uh, what, inebriated characters like Joe McCarthy, right? Or they're, you know, village explainers like Coyne Harvey, who was one of the populists in the 1890s. I mean, these are not, they're not uh, men of great power and wisdom who are going to be your leader. That was different. And that has to do, I think, with the character of celebrity and, um, reality TV and how and how he managed to market himself. I mean, I think most Americans thought of Donald Trump as the guy on the on the, on the apprentice saying you're fired. That's yeah. strength, a man of power. Um, and if you're on a mainstream network TV show for however many years he was, 14, I think, and, and you're a big yeah. celebrity and people are treating you like a celebrity, it's a little hard to marginalize that person the way you could a regional figure like a George Wallace or, a, as you say, one senator who's, you know, Right, has a short run that yes. ends up. Yeah, I think that that was yes. more important to Trump's success than people realize. I think. I, I think that's right, and also he's not political. I mean, you know, he it it, it didn't. You know, George Wallace, for all you want to say, was a you know an Alabama politician. Um, um, no, but he he transcended politics. He transcended American life. He was a different kind of figure, and and I think that that's something we've never seen before. It helps it helps explain what has become the cult around him. Um, you know, um, um, but it's a cult. Again, there are many cult figures in American history. Um, um, Jim Jones, Jonestown on back. But, and, 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 but they tend to be, you know, have a religious character, which Trump does not. And even though he's brought the, you know, the evangelicals to support him, it's not because he's a very pious man. Right. Um, but in building up this cult, he has the, the non-political, indeed anti-political thing going for him as well which I think was extremely effective uh, against Hillary Clinton, who he, he, de he demonized not only as a crook, but as a quintessential, you know, this is everything you hate about politics. There's the person who, who embodies that. I am not that, I'm the alternative. But that's also very, very different. Um, um, or yeah, it's very different from, from most of what we've seen. How much do you think social media, we, we touched on that. I think you were gonna say maybe something word about that when I mentioned the pamphlets from 1964, I mean, how much of a difference does that make? Yeah, I mean, it only amplified it I, and amplified and segmented. And, and this is a cliche, we all know this, but nevertheless, it's true. Um, you know, the, the explosion of, from Facebook and, and on and on into the deep web, I mean, realms that I don't know about, but I'm sure they're there, have made it possible for, um, well, Look, when we were kids, there were the three networks and Walter Cronkite really made a difference. Walter Cronkite would not have allowed what's going on in the, say, the 2020 campaign. It could not have happened. Um, that all broke down. It broke down in a series of steps along the way. Um, I think actually going back to the 80s and, and getting rid of the fairness doctrine, I thought it was always a terrible mistake because what it did was to release um, communications from any sense of public service, any sense of public commitment. I mean, quite apart from what you, whether you thought liberals were really running the thing or not, nevertheless, it severed. It was the, you know, the separation of, of you know, media and responsibility, um, communal, you know, community responsibility. I thought that was a terrible idea. Um, but, but beyond that, then you get cable television, then you get, you know, certain people like Murdoch coming in and, and taking over a lot of that. 
And then you get, of course, the internet and finally you get social media. And what that does is to make it possible for Trump in a way that no other person could have done to leapfrog everything and to get directly to his people. That's what a tweet is about. I mean, the tweet is the ultimate unmediated um, communication. And all the better that it's only in how many characters, 280 characters, what have you, because it forces you to be concise. And that's about the most that people need to understand. And boom, you can, and you can keep it going. Um, this, is, this has changed everything. Um, um, and I so, guess the echo chamber character of it too, right? The kind of your own reality and between Facebook and email and twi- you know, and who you follow on Twitter. And that's right. Is, and that seems, and that's always been the case, sort of. Obviously, the Birchers, the Birchers had a different reality than mainstream America. It's, you know, think of liberal professors and so forth. But well, somehow that's it, right. feel, it feels quantitatively and therefore maybe qualitatively different today, somehow. Yeah. If you were looking at the elite, it seemed as if it was much more powerful, you know, liberal power is much greater. The elite, that elite means nothing any, <laughs> anymore, speaking as a professor. I mean, we can run little pieces here and there, but compared to the gigantic, you know, boom, that is, that is the social media these days, there's been a displacement of, and indeed, there's been a displacement of authority. And that's, that's important as well. I mean, it's not just, you know, professorial authority, although that's getting undone too, I must say, but, uh, or truth, that is to say, or veracity. Um, but across the board, there's been an un, un, undoing. Everybody's voice counts as every, you know, much as everything. It's a kind of faux democracy. Um, which, which, what, what, what you end up with is there is no truth, and it becomes the ultimate kind of, you know, um, 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 I don't know, post sixty eight, uh, post modernist you know, nightmare. Except it is a nightmare. It's not. It's not anything great. By undermining authority, you weren't liberating anything. You were just going to bring chaos, and 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 ultimately author- authoritarianism, because there are authoritarians who can pick up on the chaos and turn it into them, and that's exactly what Trump has managed to do. I guess the the, the undermining of legitimate authority, so to speak, or traditional authority makes it easier for authoritarians, not of a kind, at least, not harder. Absolutely. I mean, I think that the the, the foolish um, um, utopianism of, you see this a lot with the kind of, um, you know, the web, the web libertarians, which is, you know, let everybody have the same, everybody should have a voice. There should be no gatekeepers. That was the, that was the, um, you know, the, the term. Um, you know, speaking as a gatekeeper myself, I'm a gatekeeper in everything I do. I grade papers. I, I'm, but um, but but what it that was always a, a, a false anyway because there were you weren't going to get rid of gatekeepers. You're simply going to establish new ones, and they're going to you know guard different gates in different ways. That was number one. But number two, to the extent that you do undermine authority, then then the person who can speak the loudest and the strongest can give you a meaning of truth that has nothing to do with understanding, knowledge, reflection, er, you know, erudition, forget, but, but I mean, you know, you, unearned authority, authority based simply on prowess or based on celebrity, based on might, that person takes over and, um, you know, can assemble the chaos and explain everything to everybody. And nobody, the utopians didn't count on that. And, and we're seeing that happen. It's, it's, it's a perfect nightmare. And I suppose we've, so we've always had demagogues, um, Trump, maybe he's a particularly skillful one in certain ways, but as you say, he doesn't seem as, he's not just a right wing, or he is, it turned out to be, but he, he didn't sound like a Pat Buchanan who comes out of a sort of very particular tradition, which right. a lot of Americans right. weren't in favor of. So right. Trump was able to be a broader, maybe have a broader appeal, but mostly it's, so he's a demagogue in a social and cultural and technological, I guess, environment where demagoguery is more effective perhaps, or can be more effective than it was. And, and there's no pushback. I mean, the pushback is minimal. I mean, there's also the particularities of, of well, we can get into this too. I mean, there's a the particularity of Trump's relationship to the Republican Party and how he battened onto what was going inside the party and managed to turn it to his advantage. Um, um, so there are those kinds of very specific historical conjunctures. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, I think that, I mean, what, what we're getting at here, I think, Bill, is the, the, the level at which we're talking about the abolition of fact or the abolition of truth or the abolition of, of any sense of what is true, except what the loudest voice is telling you is true. And it's very, unless there's a pushback against that, an effective one, and it's very hard to construct one. I mean, back in the, back in the good old days, in the 1930s, you know, Franklin Roosevelt could take to the radio and outdo Charles Coughlin, a, a radio demagogue. Um, 
it's much harder. I mean, you know, I'm at, you know, I mean, I suppose during the election, people, at the, I, I suppose the Lincoln Project came as close as anybody to, to doing that because, you know, Republicans do this much better than Democrats. So they came up with very witty ads that were very effective. But even there, you know, I mean, it was not going to be able to undo what was coming out of the, the Trump you know, uh, world. Um, so it's, but so there's, it's the lack of pushback, I think, as well. I mean, in the old days, you could push back against the demagogue, right? You could push back against Joe McCarthy. And in the end, it would be people from Joe Welch to, to Ed, you know, Ed Murrow, right? With uh, People the People, or whatever, however he got it. I forget the name of the show. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, um, but there's no, there seems to be, I mean, you know, CNN, um, MSNBC, these are not particularly effective um, counters, counterweights, um, mainly because they, in part because they don't stand for authority. They stand for, you know, arguing against. It's just a different version of Trump in a, in a, you know, obviously they're not as, as mendacious. They're not as, as, as mad, but nevertheless, it comes across that way that it's right. just, you know, there is no neutral authority. There is no arbiter. Everybody's out for himself. It's everybody's out for himself world. And, you know, we're going to, we're going to judge ideas on that basis. Uh, that's what it's all become. And it's, it's frightening. And I suppose on the kind of contingency of history theme, I mean, of course he won. I mean, that is if Trump had lost by clo fairly close race, but still lost in 2016, maybe Trumpism would be as strong as it seems today or, or somewhat, you know, would have stayed yeah. dominant in the Republican party. Maybe not. We should talk about the Republican party a bit, I suppose, but, yeah. but no. it's also possible we would look back at it the way we look back at Goldwater, who lost, yeah. at Ross Perot, at Joe McCarthy, at Pat Buchanan, and I mean, many, many people who, Huey Long, I mean, people who were important. Right, uh, right. And distorted right. our politics in certain ways, and distorted it maybe as unfair, but whatever, um, uh, affected our politics in certain ways. Mm -hmm. So I guess uh, having a president, I, I've always thought this, having him win, that's really unique in modern American history. We haven't really had a demagogue as president. And Correct. secondly, that as president, there was that moment where people thought it wasn't totally crazy. Okay, he won. It was a pretty disreputable way to win, but he will now semi-grow into the presidency and he, he surely won't behave quite the way he did as a reality show guy or a birther or a candidate. And in fact, he kept on behaving that way and got, has gotten, I would say, honestly, more and more that way. I mean, I'm not really making worse. value judgment, but just empirically in that, of course, culminating now in the post, the five or six weeks since the election. Right. So that really has got to make a difference, right? It's one thing to have a lot of these characters, even at reasonably high levels in our politics, saying and doing these things. It's another thing to have the president of the United States for four years doing it. But you can't quite say, well, this is a fringy thing if he's the president of the United States. Uh, exactly. I mean, he, there's not just trappings of power at its real power. I mean, he does things. He says things and things happen. Um, Lyndon Johnson was once was, once was talking to a professor at Columbia and... and um, the, the, the professor asked him, you know, what is power? And Johnson picks up the telephone and orders Marine One to land and, you know, in front of him take, and take him to Camp David. And he puts on the phone and says, that's power. <laughs> now that's, but that's the power that Trump had. And, and it's not just, you know, it's, it's not incidental. It has to do with authority and the authoritarian demagogue actually had authority and, and he could get things, he could get things done. Um, what would have happened had he lost or he did lose, except he didn't? He didn't lose the Electoral College, and um, which is the, what counts, the only thing that counts. Um, I think it would have happened, I think my guess is it would have been very much what he had expected to do, which was that this is the greatest infomercial ever imaginable, that he was going to go back to Trump stake, you know, no longer Trump stakes. He could have had Trump TV and he could have taken on Murdoch and he would have done his own thing. I mean, but I think he would have returned to you know, what are the things that are most important to him, which is making money and, and you know, a, a, a grabbing, the, a grabbing that kind of you know, celebrity. My guess is that's what would have happened. And the Republican Party would have moved on. What's happened is not just what, what Trump has done to the country, but also what he's done to the party. And, and, you know, that's the effect on American politics that I think we're going to have to figure out and live with for the next four years, if not longer. Um, is, is, you know, what, what, what are we to make of all of this? What are the state of American political institutions? Um, um, but I don't think he was thought he was going to win. I don't right. think he ever, I think the whole thing was chaotic from day one. But the little bits that I've heard from the inside the White House was that it was just a madhouse, that um, it was all being seat of the pants, um, that there was no clear direction at any, at any point. It was all very in, by instinct. And, uh, 
you know, this is the, this is where God comes in again, in the sense that he's looking after the United States. I mean, even with Donald Trump in the White House, the Constitution exists. We had a very, I mean, I, I think, I thought, I don't know about you, Bill, but I thought it was a remarkable election on, on November 3rd. I mean, in the midst of a, yeah. of a health crisis, we actually had a, a, a law, huge turnout. Now, a lot of it was mail-in, but never mind. It was legitimate votes were cast, and there was no chaos. It was all yeah. very, very, really, actually very moving in some ways, I thought to see that happen. That was American democracy at its finest. Um, and so it's, so despite Trump- you know, Oh, sure, right. Well, you let's know. talk about the institutions. I mean, some of the different yeah. institutions because as you say, some of them seem to have held quite admirably, some more shaky, some some not at all. But I guess, right. or, or another way of putting it is you wanna do that thought experiment if he had lost. I think the next thought experiment is what if he had won, but the Republican party had said, you won, you're the Republican president. <sighs> by which, let's say the Republican Party in Congress, which is the effective yes, right. Republican Party. But we're not simply going along with everything. We're gonna make clear from the beginning that there, we're gonna have our own legislative agenda. We're gonna treat you a little right. more like a 19th century president who you know, is right. important, but we're not gonna right. let you be the exactly the party leader right. in, in as, and indeed a stronger party leader than right. Obama or Bush or any of the others. Uh, right. We're not gonna justify, we're not gonna be scared of you. We're not gonna uh, refuse to, challenge you when you do out or say outrageous things, et cetera. Now, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think that's a pretty different history over the last four years. Yeah. I do think people slightly, they don't overestimate Trump, but the importance of the enabling by the party as a practical matter is what made Trump has made Trump so very, very powerful. You can write a scenario in other democracies where you get a sort of flaky or at the state level, you get a Jesse right. Ventura or becomes Governor right. of Minnesota or Schwarzenegger. Right. I mean, these are both, yeah. I think, Schwarzenegger, a decent person. He wasn't like Trump, but right. uh, in his governance. But, you know, he's governor for six, seven years. Right. The state goes on. There's not a whole lot of Schwarzeneggerianism in the in either party in California. And we have something right. resembling normal politics out there, right? Yeah. yeah. But that yeah. could have been, in a way, Trump. Berlusconi might be an instance of this, too, where you get a president who's a celebrity and a media star, right. but you get the right. impression that, you know, it didn't. But with right. Trump, it really is different, I think, because of the party. Mm -hmm. So that's the one mm -hmm. institution I feel like that that most, somewhat surprisingly to me, maybe I was a little more surprised than I should have been, totally uh, did more than capitulate, really enabled him. So, so I mean, what and, and were parties thought to be, this was actually a theme of Hofstadter, right? I mean, parties were thought to be a barrier to this kind of thing, not Absolutely. an enabler of it. So... There were thoughts, those who thought it would be an enabler of, of, of you know, Caesarism or demagoguery, but, but in fact, no, it was designed precisely to um, you know, provide a body um, that was going to prevent that sort of thing. It was going to do, you know, to American politics, what Madison hoped the Constitution would be able to do, but the Constitution was able, unable to do it on its own. Political parties, in effect, you know, serve that, that, that function in part. I mean, you know, Bill, you're asking you're asking you're asking Mitch McConnell to to imitate another Kentucky and Henry Clay, which he was not in the you know about to do. Um, he wasn't about to do it not simply because he's not Henry Clay. Henry Clay was an extraordinary figure in American political life and American political history. Um, but but apart from that, there's the it's the fact of the Trump base, which gets us back to the social media and all of that. I mean, Trump really did very early on frighten the bejesus out of fellow Republicans on the Hill because he had a direct contact, direct contact with the people that were going to make or break their political future. And, you know, if he wanted to primary you, he could have primary you. And if he was going to get these people to do something. So so that, I think, um, made things very, very different than they could have possibly been before. Um, I don't think you got even, I don't think Trump would have been elected in the first place without that stuff. But once he is elected, it makes him all the more dangerous because he then has a lev the leverage over the party, which a person 20, 30 years ago wouldn't have had um, if a flake had come along. Um, but, 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 you know, that being said, there's been a long process, I think, within the history of both parties, but particularly the Republican Party, which has, you know, dissolved those other forms of constraint. I mean, if in the case of the Republicans, you know, that's Trump's party, we'll start with them. I mean, if you go back to what Gingrich did to politics in the 90s, um, by making it into slash and burn, you know, we're going to, we're going to take down Jim Wright, and then we're going to make them out to be McGovernick, et cetera, et cetera. It wasn't, that didn't just affect what was going on in the Hill, or it, it did. And, and it showed very clearly by the time you got to 98 and then 2000, but it affected politics everywhere. 
I mean, it became this idea that that politics was no longer, you know, one party against another. It was that Manichaean view again. I mean, that, that the other party has to be destroyed. You can't just beat them. You can't just beat them and then expect them to beat you and you'll go back and forth. No, you, there, there's something higher here. And I think Gingrich introduced that in politics. And I think it had a nefarious effect down the line because, I mean, I always think of, 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 of the speaker as kind of the Robespierre of the whole thing, but he sets, in, he sets in, in motion a kind of reign of terror that never ends. It's like the French Revolution with no Thermidor. There's never, a, there's never you know, it just keeps getting wilder and wilder because, you know, each, each right-wing crazy whatever conglomeration can undo the other using the same tactic. And it keeps on going. And I think the end of that process actually is Donald Trump. And, and, I, and I think that that was what, um, I mean, and, and lots of people have written about this. I'm not making, you know, this is nothing new to me. Um, um, there are plenty of studies of all of this, of the radicalization of the, and that's maybe the, not the right word, but the, um, you know, the, the, the transformation of the Republican party over the, over, over the course of the years after Reagan. Um, then, you know, with the Democrats, it's, it's the same kind of problem. I mean, they didn't, they didn't have that. Um, but, but you can see in the aftermath of 2008 that, you know, there's a, great, there's a great deal of frustration among rank and file Democrats, and especially many younger people whose memory of American politics extends back no further than possibly September 11th, 2001, and really not 2008. And I think that their view of politics became so cynical and jaundiced and, 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 and jaded um, that they were up for um, being, uh, you know, taken away by, um, you know, the forces of the, the forces she out there now, um, which really regard, you know, um, not just the Republican party, but, but moderate Democrats as, you know, all that is standing, you know, they are the ones who are, are, are nefarious or all the same Tweedledum Tweedledee. I mean, you know, you know, you know, the arguments, it's the, it's the hard left view of, of American politics. And um, there were dynamics inside the Democratic Party that were going to lead to that, to, 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 to that part of the uh, of the equation. Um, but but I think what you're hitting on, Bill, or, or what I'm taking from it is 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 how central parties are, and American political parties have been in trouble for a very long time, going way back before Newt Gingrich, for 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 for, for, for Lord's sake. I mean, so so that really is a part of the, the institutional crisis of American politics, not what's going on inside of government. It's not a constitutional problem because you know there are no parties in the constitution, but it is a fundamental problem because parties have been around almost since the beginning and certainly since the 1820s. And you know when parties fall apart, you end up with civil wars, and that's exactly what happened in the 1850s. And you know the parties reconstituted themselves, but along lines that Southern slaveholders could not abide, and they seceded. And boom! Um, now you have a you know reconstruction of parties. And then a re-reconstruction of parties in the in the 60s. But right now, I mean, people talk about polarization and how people identify, you know, left and right, Democrat, Republican, et cetera. But as institutions, the parties are much weaker than they've ever been right. before. And this goes back to the reforms of the 70s. And um, 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 and in some ways the Reagan Revolution helped do this as well. Um, parties themselves, you know, when we were kids smoke filled rooms meant something. And it wasn't just that, you know, that people were still smoking. It was that, you know, there were, there were party leaders. I had a, I had a, a relative who was, you know, one of the, the leaders of the Democratic, uh, the, the New Jersey Democratic Party. His name is David Wilentz. He was the, he was the prosecutor of, in, in the Lindbergh kidnapping trial. But, you know, I remember being awoken. I was all of, what, nine years old, being awakened um, by my parents to see him on TV in the 1960s. Democratic convention. There's your, there's your, but he was in the middle of, you know, with David Lawrence from Pennsylvania and they were actually, you know, <laughs> right. they were running the show. Now those days are gone. Um, there are people who say good riddance. I don't know about that. Um, a quick story. Um, I, I, I met my cousin David a couple of times and he once said to me, he says, you know, he's an old man by now. Um, he says, uh, our generation was all a bunch of old, Political machine hacks. That was us, you know. And who did who did you who did who did we give you as presidents? We gave you FDR. We gave you Harry Truman. We gave you Jack Kennedy. And Eisenhower on the Republican side, who would not have been the nominee if it weren't for the a absolutely political we're, apparatus. Yeah. We're only talking Democrats. He's a Democrat. So, but the, in okay. this conversation, but yes, he could have said that. Um, you know, even Lyndon Johnson. Just, you guys, what do you give us? 
Michael Dukakis. You give us, <laughs> you give us Michael Dukakis. And, and, and he, had a, he had a point. I mean, not to, to run down Governor Dukakis, who was a fine civil servant, but politics were different in those days. And, and, and it's not as if those guys, not running them down, not even running Dukakis down, but you know, they did pretty well, <laughs> all things considered. And maybe that was the health of the system that we lost touch with in, in, in the 1960s, 70s, um, with our, you know, our rage at this and our rage at that. All, by the way, all um, justified. You know, the, the bosses were not good for everything and there should have been reforms. But I always thought that something was, what it did was it, it, it undid the party as an institution. And those guys were the life of the party, as it were but they were the soul of the party, but they were also um, upholding an institution, which I think had a salutary effect in American life, not simply in, in keeping coherence, you know, keeping demagogues from you know, getting the kind of influence they have now, but also in conducting conflict. I mean, you could get things done through a party. You could actually, you know, it, it was a force of both, how to put it, I mean, it's kind of controlled conflict. It's conflict that's not going to go out, spin out of control, and yet it was going to be, it was going to preserve what was really very necessary, which is that you know we're going to fight about things. I mean, we're going to have differences of fundamental differences about how the country ought to be run, and and that's what that's what American politics is about. But parties gave a way to conduct that fight in a way that was going to be you know um, 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 keep things together, but also enable that fight to be to be done, you know, to to happen. Um, where in, 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 in the system we have today, what kind of, there's no fight. You're not going to get anything done. It's not going to be a, I, I doubt that there's going to be a really interesting um, fight about even something as, as, as necessary. Well, it's the stimulus plan we just saw. I mean, we got it through, but, you know, by the skin of our teeth. And, uh, you know, we haven't seen, let's just say, you know, interesting legislative battles over the last, you know, four to, to 12 years, really. I mean, for a long time. So, so parties, it comes back to parties, Bill. Yeah, I think that, that sounds right. It's very interesting to really think through because you could argue, right, that the most of the Madisonian system has worked reasonably well. Those institutions have held up, except for Congress, I would say, where the separation of yes. powers hasn't held up. But that's because right. it hasn't held up because the character of our parties changed. Right. And as you say, they became at once weaker and much more authoritarian at the same time, yes. both internally yes. in Congress and then in terms of uh, deference to the president of that party. Right. Right. And, uh, but I guess people have studied this. I mean, obviously modern mass democracy required something to organize popular participation. The parties were the way of doing it. We had a two party system, other countries, parliamentary countries often had multi-party mm -hmm. systems that could be, mm -hmm. the merits of each could be debated and mm -hmm. the historical reasons for that. But, um, yeah, it's not clear that the Madisonian system works without some viable party system, or maybe we can now invent it in a way it does work. I don't know, but that's I mean, the question. That's the question. And I look around, I'm trying to find James Madison, but I don't, I don't see him um, because Madison did both. I mean, Madison both invented. He, well, that's a good point. Yeah, but he did. You know, he invented the Dem the, the Democratic Republican Party. So um, that's part of his founding, really, that we don't. Those of us who are too literal minded about what it means to be a founder <laughs> probably don't appreciate that part of it. It's, it's, it's a it's a it's a long founding. Um, um, yeah, but it, 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 it didn't it didn't end in 1788. Um, um, they had to see what how it was going to work. So I, I, I think if you give Madison, if you take both, then the Madison system, Madisonian system more or less works. Um, um, but but part of it has been very badly damaged. And there's a lot of reasons why. And I'm not going to I mean, I have mine and they're books right. item written about this but but I, I think we can all agree that the, the parties are not what they they were and um, um, I think on balance that's a bad thing it does seem to me I look at the current moment and I had a conversation with Ron Brownstein about this and he predicted sort of just trench warfare for the next four years the trenchers between the parties deeper and wider than ever and less yeah. chance to compromise and, you know, there's always a contrarian possibility, right, that maybe you get sort of backbench revolts and attempts to work together and, and, and the, the, you know, just at some point the trench warfare becomes unsustainable or unattractive or some entrepreneurial politician, you know, if you change those things, you probably do need some structural changes in the way Congress works, maybe in the way presidential, the presidential nominating process works right, too, I don't know. Right, but I mean, right. I mean, as a historian, I guess, what's your sense of 
are we at a pregnant moment where things could really change or are we more likely at a moment where Trump is kind of the, unfortunately, the first of many yeah. products of a really uh, a system that's not able to, to produce either compromise right. or, or right. command public support without because with, right. in a non-demagogic way, I guess is the way to say yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, look, I mean, I, 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 I highly regard Ron Brownstein as, you know, one of the, the great political observers of our time. So, so in disagreeing with him a little, I'm not going to, you know, this doesn't mean that I don't think that what he says is right. probably going to come true. Um, I do think there's still room for um, maneuver. I don't think that things have been foreclosed. I, I, I'm not so sure that Trump will be able to keep it going for himself. Um, he's failed at everything else he's ever done. Um, why should we think that he's going to succeed now? Um, um, I mean, he, he could be in jail. Um, and, and that is a real possibility now. I'm not predicting that by any means, but I'm saying, you know, we're at a moment where contingency can play a big role and we can go in a lot of different directions. But if Trump's in jail, then I think we have a different situation, um, obviously. Um, but the thinking about even if he's off to the side, um, you know, well, just dealing with, with personalities um, and, and, and particulars. The last two Democratic presidents who came into office um, were both, shall we say, wet behind the ears as far as Washington politics was concerned. They knew nothing, really. Um, I mean, Barack Obama had been around for a couple of years as a, as, a, as a United States senator. He didn't really know anything. And neither did Bill Clinton, who was a governor of Arkansas. He knew how to run a, Arkansas, but he didn't know how to run the United States. They were not practice executives. The last time a Democratic president came in who really knew what he was doing <laughs> was Lyndon Johnson, um, who came in at a very particular tragic moment in, in our past. So the question is whether Joe Biden, who's a creature of the Senate, um, can adapt to, to the White House. In other words, he can, he can, he can you know, figure out how it's done down at the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue, but bring all that experience to bear in a way that will be fruitful. And um, you know, that makes him different from other you know, Democratic presidents at any rate that, that we've seen. And, and you know, for that matter, Republican presidents too. I mean, you know, George W. knew Washington a lot better than a lot of the Democrats did, but he was still a you know, governor of yeah. Texas, you know, not a powerful executive role. And uh, you know, his dad, yes, but not him. His dad was the last you know, one who came in with that kind of experience. So we're talking about a long time in American politics when you know, inexperienced people <laughs> have been at the head. And that's, um, um, may maybe that will change. You know, that, that could change. It's entirely possible. Um, um, there are fissures in the, on, 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 certainly on the Republican side. I mean, I've sometimes thought that I would love to be in a room with, you know, Lisa Murkowski and Mitt Romney and um, 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 Susan Collins. And, uh, you know, they would declare themselves, we're in charge of everything right now because you both need us and, and we're not going to listen to either of, you know, either side of you automatically. I mean, that could, I'm not saying that's going to happen by any means, but, but there's room there. There, there the, 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 things are not so monolithic now um, that, that, nothing, that nothing can be done. Um, um, it's going to, um, it really falls on, on, on the White House. I mean, I, 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 think about this. I mean, historically, okay, in 1933, Lyndon, uh, Lyndon Johnson, in 1933, um, FDR comes into, into office with a very powerful mandate, true, um, with a very powerful Congress behind him, true, with a very powerful party behind him, and Jim Farley, all true. Um, but he comes into office with, a, with a, a world historic catastrophe on his hands in the form of the Great Depression, right? Here's Joe Biden with not a great mandate, um, with a very weak party coming to office with three, at least three major um, you know, world historic, well, two and a half at any rate. Um, you can judge which are which, but the pandemic, the, um, the racial turmoil and the economy. And, and uh, wow, I mean, that's a triple whammy right there. Now, how is he going to deal with that? Um, you know, presidents, somebody like Bill Clinton always, always used to say that, you know, behind quietly, I think that, you know, 
being president was wonderful, but he didn't have the real crisis that he, that he needed to become a really, truly great president. So, you know, uh, um, and, and I think that's, you know, that's true for a lot of presidents. You know, I mean, H.W. had the end of the Cold War. Um, um, W. had the, to that, you know, had September 11th. These are all great crises. Um, Barack Obama, unfortunately, came in with a crisis already happening, but it, and it wasn't his fault, but nevertheless, he had to deal with it. Um, this is, this is, this is mega. <laughs> this is beyond, beyond. And the question is going to be how, even with, um, you know, under adversarial circumstances politically, um, how, how, how he performs. And, you know, there is the argument that, um, you know, crisis is also opportunity and, and we'll see, we'll see if he can do it. Um, I'm so glad we sort of come near the end of this conversation to Biden because I don't think we mentioned him in the first 40 minutes or so, which is fine, but I've been in so many conversations and panels and so forth where you discussions, you know, the contemporary state of American politics, you know, all yeah, the right. same conversations we've discussed, some of the topics we've been discussing and Biden mm -hmm. never gets mentioned. And then I, I have often, I hope, remember to say, you know, it sort of matters who the president is <laughs> and what the president, yeah. how the president does. That is, yeah. I mean, if, if Biden is a successful president, whatever that means, but let's just right. say the economy gets going and he handles the pandemic well, and he holds his right. party together and right. either himself gets reelected or elects a successor if he's, mm -hmm. he's too old. That's a very different outcome and, and has very different implications for the right, the left, the Republicans, the Democrats, the parties, than the opposite, let's just say, if he's I, I, even with good intentions, if he's Jimmy Carter or something, let's just. So, and people are under, I think that is part of the contingency that people uh, underestimate, just that, that it really is a moment where a successful presidency, now how easy is it to be a successful presidency in the world we've been discussing and given that he didn't get that much of a mandate and so forth, I, that's a huge question. But uh, I think Biden really, ironically in a funny way, right? I mean, the you know, uh, the, the least exciting, maybe new president in a long time and sort of a default, maybe you might say for his well, party. And, but, but anyway, whatever history's full of these, these things. Uh, FD, right? FDR was considered a second rate playboy when he, when he won the office. I mean, it was by no means clear that he was going to be Herbert Hoover, even in 1932 till a bonus mm. happened. Uh, everybody thought Abraham Lincoln was a baboon with no particularly good ideas. I mean, right. you know, Abraham Lincoln was not Abraham Lincoln until, I mean, he was always Abraham Lincoln, but he didn't become what he became. Um, so the, the uh, underestimation of, of, of incoming presidents is, is not um, um, new. And, um, but you're right, you're right. There's the, Biden doesn't seem to be much of the conversation. And yet that's maybe the reason why he's so important, which is because he's not a person, he's not a flash, he's not a celebrity. He's an anti-demagogue. I mean, he's just not. I mean, no one could ever have, you know, people found it very hard to be angry at, at, at Biden. They invented things, I suppose, and Hunter and all the rest of it. But it didn't really, you know, people got really, really hated Hillary. Nobody really hated right. Biden. Now, that could be, you know, part of his, of, of, of the formula for his success. And I think you're absolutely right. A successful presidency under the circumstances that he's working would be a major victory, would be a major shift. I mean, if you can get the the, 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 the pandemic, first of all, under control and there's a vaccine and it's more or less orderly and people are, not, that would be a major change and a, 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 a good thing. And then the economy, obviously. Um, and um, I think that if you do, if those two things happen, then a lot else could follow. For example, I think the problems inside his party would diminish because I think a lot of the problems inside the party are fed with the frustration you know, that people had. And, and um, that might, you know, an effective presidency could very well dampen a lot of that stuff. Not all of it, but some of it. And then, you know, you go down the list. A, a competent and effective presidency over the first year, um, if, if he can pull that off and with a certain degree of, you know, presence, which he's capable of doing. I mean, I, people, people kind of run him down a lot. Uh, you know, he's not flashy. Thank God. You know, that's my view. Um, um, uh, it might be something be, to be said for, you know, a kind of quietness. He's also going to have to be tough, however, and that that is something that he's going to have to be tested on because, you know, his, his, the Senate is a very different place than the White House. And the Senate is about getting along with people. And that's what he's learned. And I don't think a president gets along with people in the same way. You cannot do that. And he's going to have to learn pretty quickly how to 
how to take, as I say, the experience from one end of Capitol Hill and bring it down to the other and to feel it in his bones. And that requires, you know, real, I mean, ruthless. I mean, FDR, Lincoln, I mean, these are, these are, these are people who knew how to, you know, uh, how to, not only just to fight, but knew how to, how, to, how, to, how to, you know, stick it to you if, you had, if it had to be done and, um, and how to dissemble and how to lie um, for the public good, not, not, not crazy stuff. But you know what I'm saying? I mean, how to be an effective leader requires something that senators don't necessarily you know, learn, even if they've been there for 45 years. Um, and I don't think you necessarily learn it as vice president. So we'll see. Yeah, that is, uh, we will see, I guess. And it's, um, I mean, it's a very unusual moment. And I, I guess the other question is, could there be structural reforms of parties, of the nominating process, of social media regulation, of all kinds right. of things that would have some effect in countering this, all these different, or for that matter, economic policy and, you know, right, right, doing a better right. job of taking care of those left behind by globalization and so forth. Right. It would help to counter all these trends, which kind of came together in some perfect yeah. storm yeah. that produced Trump. And I, I suppose we don't know. I mean, it's not impossible. It's not, uh, we've done these kinds of things before. I mean, I guess, I think. No, we have, we have. I mean, um, you know, there's always been new technologies and, you know, new technologies, you know, this is a cliche again, but it's not untrue. New, uh, new technologies lead to new forms of politics. Printing press changes everything. Radio changes everything. TV changes everything. Maybe this changes everything. Um, they've usually been adapted to and mastered and, and, you know, for the forces of, if not for the forces for good, at least for the forces of stability. Um, um, and then they can, they can be stabilized. I don't know that this can, but you know, history does not, is not discouraging on the, on, uh, on the score, doesn't, you know, certainly isn't uh, pessimistic on the score. Um, the structural things are going to be hard because a lot of the structural things that would matter are, would require constitutional amendments, um, which are not going to happen anytime soon. Um, but that's okay. Um, policy can take you a long way, you know, and, and, and policy is not a substitute for structure. But I think that as I say, if we can have a successful, successful presidency, to, here's here's what I'm saying, Bill. It's about it's about a sense of connection and legitimacy. I don't think I think that that people feel so disconnected from their own government. I don't care, even people like you and me who are deeply you know think about politics all the time. We don't have the kind of identification either with the government or with our political process and parties that we once did, or that people that our parents and their their parents had. And I think to restore the legitimacy of American politics, you know, um, uh, and, and overcome the cynicism of American politics, that's something that no structural reform can actually do on its own. That's going to be a matter of people and policies and 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 and, and changing that. And and that's the that to me is, is at the core of what our problems are. And um, you know, we'll see. We hope we elect the best people. Um, I mean. For me, it's always a, a lo it becomes a local matter after a while. So I, I have my, you know, my, my my favorites in Congress that I work for very hard and hope that they will eventually, you know, be the seed for the future. Um, but but that's just me. Um, yeah. but, but I think it's I think it's I think it's a profound problem we're, we're running up against. I mean, these are these are pre-revolutionary times in a in a weird way, right? I mean, when the when the legitimacy of an entire political order is under question, the way that ours is now. Um, I'm not going to, uh, there's not going to be a civil war or revolutionary in the kind, but it's scary to live in those moments. Um, you know, you, you can sort of, you know, feel, you can understand what Kerensky was going through. I mean, right. you know, I mean, you're watching a whole, you know, a faith that was there, um, not for all Americans. I'm not trying to, you know, make it all peachy fine by any means, but there was a fundamental connection, which I think has come under challenge. And that I think has been broken. And I think it's been breaking since the late '60s. And I, 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 I think that that has to be reassembled and and um, modernized, if you will, updated. You know, take into account all of the things that weren't being taken into account of before, with from race on out. Um, but the conversation around those things these days has gotten so jaded and cynical that um, you know something has to be restored. And I hope that we can do it. That is a good note to end on, and I think the ch the challenge is big. But as you say, there there are many instances where the center didn't hold, uh, to use a, a phrase that's become such a cliche. But I guess yeah, I right, guess Yates right. wrote that almost exactly a century ago, you know. That's and, right. Um, that's right. But uh, there are cases where it has held and or been rebuilt or restored or or 
built up anew almost. And so uh, we will say, well, we have to maybe a, a year into the Biden presidency, we can reassemble and you can give us your historical judgment of, of how he's doing. And also what's happening in the Republican Party. Because, I mean, there's such yes. interesting developments on both yes. sides to, ahead. And uh, yes, but I think the, the thought about the contingency of it and the importance of the presidency is really an important one because often historians go the other direction and it's all these macro forces that are carrying us along. But for you, neither you nor Dick Hofstadter are, uh, are that kind of historian, right? So. Don't believe, don't believe them. <laughs> Good. Okay. I, on that note, I'm going to, I, I, we shouldn't, I won't believe them. Our, 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 our viewers and listeners shouldn't believe them, but Sean, thanks so much for joining me today. My, really my pleasure. It. My uh, pleasure, Bill. I said. And thank you all for joining us on Conversations.